Welcome to this episode of Dental IQ. I'm your host, Fabio Alfieri, and joining me this week is Dr. Tony Day, a dentist based in New Zealand who has grown three very successful businesses over his career. Dr. Day currently runs a clinic in New Zealand, but also founded Lands Dental, a recruiting agency that helps place dental professionals and then assists in growing their practice. He's also recently co-founded The Dental Group, a business that acquires existing practices and then helps manage the business side of their clinic. Stay tuned to hear about Dr. Day's success story and also about the organizations he's currently involved in. Enjoy the episode. Dr. Tony Day, thank you so much for joining us on Dental IQ this week. Yeah, no problem, Fabio. Uh, Tony, I'm really excited to actually dive into a lot of the points that we've spoken about earlier. You've worked on a lot of really interesting things in your career and are currently doing some really awesome stuff with your own businesses. But, you know, just so our audience can get to know you a little bit first, why don't we start a bit about yourself? Um, I'd love to know your background, as, uh, your background as a dentist and sort of where that kick started for you. Yeah, it's a, yeah, been a dentist 20 years now. So back when I was a kid, my parents were sort of educationalists and they wanted uh, to better better the education system, so they sent me to the dental school in Dunedin to have uh, have my teeth practiced on by dental students, and Lovely. I really really enjoyed that interaction, and that gave me an interest in the profession. So I was probably only seven or eight years old, and then as I grew older, I thought that it, yeah looked like a pretty good gig, and I was good at the sciences and things. So yeah, ended up graduating out of Otago, back in the same dental clinics as I was treated in as a kid. Um, wow. 2001 and yet yeah, it always been something I wanted to do so it took a bit of hard work at uni sort of um, the first year wasn't too good but after that I pulled finger and ended up doing okay and then uh, yeah that was that was the start of it and as a lot of people do headed off and worked in the public sector worked in the big hospital um, Waikato mm-hmm. hospital doing lots of the trauma staff was where that started um, so, you know, you're getting lots of volume dentistry there. You're seeing broken jaws and cancer treatments and, and getting, you know, further, further socialised, you know, getting to understand the importance of our profession and, and you know, what a difference it can make in people's lives. Um, mm. Yeah. So this is a really <laughs> early seated interest for you. You know, right from the get-go, you always knew that this is what, what you wanted to do. At any point, did that sort of ever change for you? Was there anything along the way that thought, you know, maybe I want to do this instead or maybe this or? Yeah, and I guess that was, um, yeah, a couple of years into it. I sort of, you know, sort of a lot, sort of a lot of, you know, entrepreneurial opportunities um, within the business. In fact, my first gig was to sell rubber dam to the dental school when I was still a student there and I actually still sell rubber dam to the dental school uh, just not in, not in the same volumes they've gone non-latex and my my supplier's latex so I've been cut out a bit lately but um and I just yeah that was a bit that um I'd always you know my old man being an accountant I'd always been into businesses and I saw lots of opportunity there so yeah it was then I eventually worked out that you could do them both together um mm. And that has probably been what I've concentrated on for probably the last sort of, you know, really solidly for the last 10 years um, Mm. is building dental businesses um, rather than being just necessarily a clinical dentist. I know this is a really interesting topic, especially for a lot of our listeners, you know, because there's a lot of dentists out there that are probably looking to make the same jump. You know, how can I, you know, utilize my, you know, the care that I provide every day and really apply the business acumen that I've got into, you know, and merge the two together and create a business out of it. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to talking about. But I know that you mentioned you, you do a fly in fly out service and you've done it for quite a long time. Um, I want to hear about this because, you know, you did your time in the the public sphere and the public health care uh, sort of scene. How did you transition from doing something like that into, you know, a fly and fly out service helping children? Yeah, so after that that initial hospital work, I went out and worked in in a sort of more remote uh, area just to get, you know, those your know, skills up. And then we'll talk about a bit later on what's important in a young career and what I believe is important is volume. You know, you need to be doing a lot of dentistry so you get comfortable doing a lot of different things. So I did that in a in a small, uh, more rural setting. Um, and it was uh, heavily, um, it was a Māori health organisation area. So um, there are some unique parts to that. And one of those aspects was they had a visiting um, or, uh, surgical bus. So it was an articulated truck with a full-blown operating theatre in the back of it. Um, and we would then see, you know, once every six to 12 weeks, we would see young kids of the area that couldn't have their care done 
that normally um, who required a general anaesthetic for that care, we would bring the truck in and rather than take the children to the hospital, we'd take the truck to the children. Um, and I actually, yeah, I got involved in that in those, those first couple of years out of uni, I, I, I kept doing that um, for about 15 years. Um, when the, our third child came along, I decided that to, um, whilst I liked the idea of flying out and spending a couple of nights in a hotel, my wife wasn't so keen. Um, <laughs> so I haven't been doing as much of that as I have in the past, but it was an amazing 15 years of, um, of work and, and, and understanding a totally different community. And what, what area of New Zealand was this? It was in the East, East Cape is what we call it. So mm-hmm. um, north of Gisborne. So Gisborne is a remote town, you know, um, you know, great, great summer festivals and stuff and great surfing there. But 100 k's north of there is a little town called Tokamoto Bay. I lived there for a couple of years and worked out of places like Ruatoria and Tapuya Springs, which are, you know, right out there, but uh, pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And when treating these children, what sort of cases are you coming across every day? What's like the most common sort of treatment that you're providing? And uh, I mean, also, what's some of the most concerning treatment that you're providing? Yeah, the, the, one and the same, Fabio. The, you know, the most common thing I was doing for those kids is taking their baby teeth out. You know, they, wow. were, they were so rotten um, that there was nothing left I could do. You know, these teeth were pussy and abscessed. You know, there's no, there's no stainless steel crowns or pulpotomies possible. These teeth were gone. And the yeah, very, very common um, theme would be, oh, they came out like that, is what the parents would say to me. And yeah, they did, because, you know, from a very, very young age, they were having high sugar diets. Um, and yeah, each time, yeah, as the tooth erupted through the gum, you know, that basically instantly became decayed. So mm. yeah, it's pretty pretty horrifying to see that. But there were, you know, there was, you know, what you began to understand is the the very multifactorial reasons for that. You know, it's not quite that simple as to why they end up that way. Mm. Is there much community education around oral health there? Yeah, there is there is quite good provision of that, but you know, there's not an acceptance in the community that oral health mm. is necessarily important and you know the sort of viewers oh nanny don't have no teeth you know i don't need them either so it's it's quite an intergenerational thing is that you know teeth aren't seen as being necessarily that important um because no one in the family or the whanau has looked after their teeth so why should i and right and but yeah there is a knowledge of that and i think you know the bit that irks me a bit is oh they just need to give more education yes that that would be important but you know, when you interview the girl coming out of McDonald's with her two or three young children and ask her, was that a healthy meal? Or well, she knows that it's not healthy, but it's the, the availability um, of those sorts of things that I think is problematic mm, as well. Absolutely. So it's the acceptance side of things as well, because realistically, you can only do so much education, but if the community is not going to uphold that, then I mean, there's not much more you can really try and do. Yeah, 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 and I guess my role was was more the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. It would have been great to to get further up, but you know there was so, and, and I had a unique ability to you know I had the training to do that work. So that was that was the bit I focused on. And there are others certainly you know working in the education. I think you know you know things like sugar taxes and limitations mm-hmm. of marketing those types of products to children. I think would be very beneficial too, as well as some you know the community becoming more accepting of good teeth. Mm, definitely definitely so for all the everyday dentists out there at the moment so aside from the helping the community aspect of this which is amazing um, you said before that you actually picked up doing this because you know you wanted to become a great dentist and you needed to do more dentistry to get there so do you think that that's you know a big benefit for dentists to get out there and try and do something similar like this so that they can you know work on perfecting their craft and experience different you know situations within the sort of dental space yeah, you have two aspects of that. One is that just generally working in a community where there's high need and you can get your volume of general dentistry up. I think that's critically important. You know, that there's something as something, you know, a younger dentist being able to get, you know, just doing good local anesthetic quickly and efficiently will then pave the way to do, you know, do your 10 veneers in the, a few years down the line because, you know, you can predictably get the patient numb. Mm. Um, and then the other aspect of it, and you know, dentists, generally speaking, are, are pretty socially driven people, and you know, the the giving back to the community in that way is really, really rewarding. And we have a very unique skill um, and a very mm-hmm. needed skill. Mm-hmm. So you know, I have 
on top of that, those general anaesthetic trips that I've done, I've also arranged a number of, you know, general mobile dental clinics going to these types of communities and got groups of dentists to come along and, and volunteer their time. And yeah, the, the reward that that stuff provides is, is huge and we, yeah, our skills so well received. Absolutely. And the point you made about it being a very needed skill is so important, isn't it? Because I mean, from a very early age, if you're not tackling this, you know, nice and early, you know, tooth decay and rot and all that sort of stuff, it can lead to really significant issues in the future. So yeah, the point of it being such a needed skill and very early on is, is bang on for sure. Um, So tell me, you went from the public health space and you're obviously working, you know, you fly in, fly out, you know, giving back to the community and, and perfecting your craft there. So what was the next step in your professional career that kind of led to that more sort of business side of what you do now? Yeah, it was a, a wee stint back at the back to the dental school for the third time. You know, a patient, a student, and then a tutor. Um, and there was sort of evaluating things there. I was saying, well, which direction do I want to go? And I worked with a um, some private practice work down there, and the the principal in that practice had had you know significant visions about what could be achieved. And I just sort of felt that they, those visions were probably quite good, but yeah, it's just actually putting those things into action was was hard. And then, you know, life moved on a little bit. I ended up in, in Auckland and I saw an ability to, you know, take some of those bigger ideas that others have had and actually just ramp, you know, put them on turbo because you've got the population in Auckland and particularly the, a population that, you know, um, metropolitan city would typically have you know people that are interested in cosmetics and aesthetics um dentistry and 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 otherwise um and then i just yeah sort of found an opportunity to um to yeah practice some of that stuff and a lot of it sort of ended up pulling off quite well so it's evolved into a bit of emotionally driven aesthetics i know is a big thing that you sort of practice in your clinics can you talk to me about that concept and why it's important to you guys yeah, so we started off um, back some time ago, I think maybe 2009, something like that. We started selling, you know, discounted tooth whitening, which is a good concept. Um, and we drove, and what we found from that, you know, we made it accessible to more people. Um, and those same people that wanted access to tooth whitening also, you know, that was a, the first step into an aesthetic improvement of their smile you know mm-hmm. so instantly they can do that and from that um we have built out a, a significant business around you know what i call yeah sort of emotionally driven aesthetic dentistry so we've got doing hundreds of aligner cases a year um i don't know how many veneer cases we do a year but um you know i'm doing two cases tomorrow so it must be quite a few um mm. and and all the bits in between you know people will i found would come to have their teeth whitened but they actually needed new teeth you know they needed implants they needed teeth taken out um but their their first step in towards that journey was the whitening um and then that then that sort of morphed into doing lots more veneer work and then you start sort of sharing that around or, or you get a, a level of reputation for delivering that care and then people keep coming and they yeah, they want more of that and mm. um and and zoom as we're on at the moment um you know it has been uh, the zoom boom they call it um yeah it's looking at their own teeth or their faces or their noses or or whatever um and and looking to make changes so we, we definitely um saw you know we had a lockdown last year coming out of that i did bucket loads of aesthetic mm. work um, and uh, yeah, we're in lockdown here in Auckland at the moment, um, a sort of semi rigid lockdown, and hopefully we're going to get as big a bounce back um, again. I suppose the reason that a lot of people come in wanting teeth whitening first up is because it's probably the most accessible and affordable confidence boost that they can get for their smile, you know, as opposed to you know, new veneers or pulling teeth out and that sort of stuff. I feel like it's, it's probably the people who just want something now to feel better about their smile. So they go in for that sort of instant result from it, right? Yeah, totally. And look, I mean, it's a great, it's a great tool done well. Um, it can be a very useful part of your business. You know, we do a huge huge number of whitenings across my my clinics so what were some of the things that you some of the strategies that you use to sort of leverage teeth whitening and you know those discounted teeth whitening results um to sort of grow your business we got into a lot of sort of customer satisfaction surveys and and then you know just simple i mean 
you sort of hear this in, in dental practice management lectures and things. We we ask people if they wanted to improve their smile. We asked people if they wanted to have Botox um, in our form, and we made sure that you know when the clinician was seeing that patient, they knew that this patient had already indicated those things. Um, so then we could frame the conversation around around that sort of work. Um, so that that was yeah, it was one of the tricks we used um, and still use quite successfully. Awesome. So I know for some time now you've actually been working on a bit of a project called Lands Dental. Um, yep. It's something that you kickstarted a while ago, and you, you know you call it a small business, but I'm sure it's you know it's doing very well uh, in in New Zealand at the moment. But could you tell me about how that kind of kickstarted and what that currently is for you? Yeah. So it actually goes all the way back to when I was out East Cape. They um, broadband arrived in, in town, and they asked who wanted it, and I uh, was <laughs> putting in for free in those days. And I said, Yep, I'm in. So I therefore had to have an online business. Um, so I started a dental recruitment company um, and almost at exactly the same time, um, a guy did the same thing in Scotland. And what his, his business was sending Scottish and British dentists to New Zealand to work. And my business was sort of taking Scottish and British dentists and New Zealand dentists and, and putting them into roles in New Zealand. And, we put that right. business together after a couple of years um, and then he he sort of fell by the wayside eventually and we've now built that business quite substantially now so that um, you know we've got you know a couple of three staff and and that's actually run out of Dunedin um, mm -hmm. where my, my actual father is now involved he retired and then um, started working for me I think I think mum's paying me to pay him to get out of the house but <laughs> Um, so the old man's in there and uh, a couple of others, you know, running one, another Tony, um, she's running the, the recruitment side of the business. And then Bruce is running the, the practice succession, the practice sales side of the business. Mm -hmm. So what we found when we started recruiting dentists was that, um, you know, these people were recruiting them because they were getting towards the end of their career or, you know, were still, you know, had an injury or health issues that meant they couldn't do as much work. And all of a sudden, the practices started coming for sale and, and the process for that in, in New Zealand at the time was pretty antiquated. Um, so we've built out some sort of digital stuff around that. So you, know, you can do all your sort of valuations and transactions and stuff within a, a portal and it all sort of works quite smoothly. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've sort of, you know, got a very strong position in New Zealand around, you know, the people to go to if you need to um, or you're looking to sell on your practice. Um, so, yeah, that that that's been quite successful. It's just, yeah, it's been something in the background and slowly got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, look, it is still very small, but um, it has, we, I feel it's got some pretty significant reach. We, we communicate through, um, you know, emails and social media and things like that with a, a very large group of dentists and it's always nice when you go to conferences and things and people say oh I've read your email and say, well, that's good um, <laughs> yeah. um and yeah then it then you just yeah it's built out a, a network of people and then it's the next phase of that is to sort of say well you know can we help you run your business um or what are the things we can that we know about that you could utilize too so there's a few products and services that um we introduce to our, our um I guess you know, our followers um and that's that's morphing at the moment into something really exciting. Um, so separate to lands is what we're calling the dental group. Um, so I've teamed up with uh, the previous CEO of Lumino, the dentists, mm -hmm. and um, you know, taking a lot of those practices that are for sale and saying, well, look, is is this model here where you join this um, this group of other dentists? Does, does that appeal? It's different to selling to your associate. It's different to selling to a corporate. Um, and yeah, I'm pleased to say that we launched that a couple of months ago and we've got, um, we, we should have 10 practices by the end of the year and, and we hope considerably more by the end of next year. Wow. So from the way I understand it is that the, the dental group essentially helps free up capital from people who own their own clinics currently. So Great. you guys step in, you acquire a portion of the clinic, the dentist continues working in there and running the whole clinical side of things, but you're essentially part owners in their clinic, right? Yeah, that's right. And then we can provide the leverage of our IP. You know, Andy's run dental practices for many years, understands those other parts of, of business management that dentists aren't very good at. You know, the dentist knows 
what materials and equipment and what types of patients that they want to be dealing with. They know what works best for them. There's no point fiddling with that. Um, but the bits that we can be useful in are, uh, you know, those more, uh, you know, financial stuff, you know, around, like say you want to expand your business, um, you know, we help people expand their business or, you know, want to streamline some things and get some efficiencies going. And then there's those, those aspects to it as well. And that, that securing the succession is the key. And I think one of the practices we're involved in is that, um, you know, we sell down a, a large percentage to the dental group and then the dental group has been able to negotiate with the other people in the in the business to then buy into the practice that way rather than that transaction having to happen between the principal, which gotcha. you know you've got that, you know, there is dentists, you know, and, and I'm the same. We we don't, we're not businessmen, you know, through and through. Um, we're clinicians and and we do have a um, a little bit of a gap in our knowledge there. And then having people to to intermediarize that is is really beneficial. Yeah, I hundred percent understand. So it's it for those people who are really wanting to focus on the clinical side of what they do every day and really just be a great healthcare professional, but sometimes find that they struggle to wear both hats of a, of a business operator and a, a healthcare professional. It's you're essentially taking that stress off them. You're providing yeah. all the experience that you guys have and, you know, show them how they can grow their business and work together with them on that and scale what they have so they Correct. can continue to be a good healthcare professional and not have to really figure out how, where I can sacrifice because, you know, sometimes sacrificing, you know, the healthcare side of things is, you know, it's, it's not the best outcome, I suppose. Yeah, that, that's dead right. Yeah. And there's, uh, and, you know, there's different models um, around succession. There's the, the large corporate groups, there's, you know, selling to your associate. And, you know, the, the key difference here is that retaining a, a decent percentage of the business. So you have, you know, quite a bit of uh, control and autonomy. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to take some ownership in the parent business of the dental group itself. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that allows you to sort of, you know, collectively build that, that dental, um, dental group of like-minded people. Yeah, for sure. So what's next, what's on the horizon for Lands Dental and the dental group then? Um, yeah. So, so Lands Dental side, um, yeah, we're excited about, um, you know, some, a line of stuff that we're doing so we're working with and it sort of comes to one of those questions down further we're talking about you know who, who's out there hustling it, who's doing a good job in dentistry at the moment and you know my good mate luke cronin has put together an aligner um, brand here in new zealand we're calling it qd active aligners um, mm -hmm. in new zealand so you know i've had amazing success with that product um, already and and we're looking to to grow that um, that that product out here in New Zealand through through the Lands Dental um, Group uh, of people and, and um, potentially through people in the dental group too may want to pick that up. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably the most exciting. But you know, we, me personally and my you know I'm just starting a, a brand new practice. Um, you know, I think it opened what yeah, it opened on Monday. Um, in the middle of a, uh, a pandemic, uh, yeah. right, back down, right, right, right downtown CBD of a lockdown city. So, yeah, she's a bit, a bit hairy down there, but um, I'm sure we will, um, we will, we'll do some stuff. And I'm pretty excited about um, some new products. There's, uh, there's a pretty cool new whitening product coming out from High Smile that uh, we're very excited to be uh, using down in that in that clinic uh, as soon as we can get our hot little hands on it. So yeah, that, um, again, it's just driving that aesthetic, uh, emotional type stuff. And on the back of that, we, we will layer in the, the implant work too. You know, that, that's huge. Um, there's so much need for that, that care. So that bit of a slightly older demographic, but um, yeah, we'll be doing lots of implant work down there. And then the dental group, yeah, we want to um, partner with and um, provide capital to, you know, a bunch of, um, you know, dentists across New Zealand um, that, you know, understand you know, the business of dentistry, but, you know, want to focus, be focused clinically, want to secure that succession, um, but also will help the younger guys um, get it, you know, give them a bit of a leg up into some ownership, or if you've got a young guy that wants to buy something, but, you know, maybe it's sort of a bigger practice that we can help with the capital for that too, and then help with some of that IP of running it. So, um, yeah, we're excited about the opportunities there. People, people have been really interested, so it's exciting. 
Yeah, great. Well, we'll do a little bit of a plug. Um, if any dentists in New Zealand at the moment are listening and they want to find out more about, you know, Lens Dental, the aligner therapy that, you know, Lou Cronin's now offering and also the dental group, um, any way that they can find out more? Yeah, the best option is just uh, the Lands Dental website, which is just www.lands.dental. Um, and yeah, you should be able to find uh, some posts and stuff about each of those uh, products there and, and an ability to contact me. I always love to chew the fat over dentistry. So yeah, happy happy to hear from anybody really on either of those, sub, any of those subjects. Great. And Lands is L-A-N-Z, correct? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Originally, right, well, Locum yep. Adventures New Zealand is where the acronym came from. Um, right. everyone, yeah, so we're, but Lands, yeah, that's, that's what we're all with. It seems to have a bit of credibility now, that brand in New Zealand. So I'm quite pleased about that. Yeah, great. great. No need to change it then if it's got a bit of credibility going yeah. for it. So that's awesome. Uh, all right. Well, that's almost all the time we've got, but I really want to get to quick fire questions. Uh, the last segment we do for every episode. So I've got four questions for you. Uh, and first answer off the top of your head, Tony, uh, we'll get stuck straight in. The first question is, what do you think will be one of the biggest advancements in dentistry in the next five years? Uh, this can be on the clinical side, but also the business side as well, if you had any thoughts. Yeah, so if you have the two, two, the, so two questions, the clinical side, it's the true digital workflow. You hear people talking about the digital workflow. Nobody currently knows what that is, okay? Like it's, it's going to evolve into something that we don't quite yet understand. And certainly in my practices, they're heavily digital. Everyone scanned, um, intraoral scan, home beam scans, and molding all that stuff together and you know, I've been following comb beam particularly for a long time and, and where they thought it was going to go, it hasn't gone there. It's gone slightly differently. Um, and I, I'm really excited to see where that stuff goes. So I'll stay real close to that. Um, on the business side of it, it's the, you know, the continued and even more aggressive consumerization, is that a word, um, of the industry. Um, and if you want to be, uh, you know, busy doing those you know, those aesthetic type stuff, those rewarding type treatments, then you're going to have to make sure that, you know, your customer experience, you would hate to say that, or at least patient experience is exceptional, you know, right from your website to your products to how you're treated in the surgery. Um, you know, it is absolutely critical. Um, mm. and, and there'll be, you know, the, the ability for other people to compete on our, in our space, you know, high smile, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, smile direct club, you know, those sorts of things. It's about harnessing what they're doing, understanding why that's so successful. And, and it'll, you know, a lot of that comes back to customer experience. So that's, mm. that's, that's for me. I couldn't agree more. I mean, like going to the dentist for a lot of people is a daunting thing and providing, like you said, the experience, but also the environment as well, the way that you treat a patient, you know, understanding that they might have sort of reservations about going to the dentist in the first place and really providing that incredible experience is what's going to actually make them want to care about their oral health. Because as soon as people don't enjoy like going to don't enjoy going to the dentist, that's when, you know, you start getting some serious problems down the track. So yeah, I couldn't agree more with the, with the experience point. All right. Question number three. If this wasn't your profession, what do you think you'd be doing instead, Tony? Um, well, it wouldn't be a fisherman. I'm terrible at fishing. It wouldn't be golf. I'm terrible at golf. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think uh, I, I don't. Um, I I do really enjoy what I do. I think you know, you know, get a job that you do what you love. I, I just don't think dentistry is on that list um, <laughs> because it is a pretty unusual uh, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I guess it would be yeah more more on the, the business side of things. You know, my whole family's um, accountants, so I guess yeah, I'll probably just be a suit downtown. Mm. Yeah, something to exercise that business acumen that you were talking about before, I suppose. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right, uh, question number three: Name one person in your industry whose work you're currently admiring. Um, yeah, I've been loving what Luke Cronin's doing with his um, aligner business. You know, he, again, he's got that, you know, I would see myself as a customer in that scenario. Um, and, yeah, he's got that experience nailed. Um, and, you know, I love what Michael App is doing, um, you know, LA tomorrow, New York next day. I think that's um, a little bit different to Auckland and Gisborne. But, hey, um, he, he's doing exceptionally well and, look, does beautiful work. So yeah, there's nailing a lot of the stuff that I've, I've touched on earlier. 
Yeah, great. Well, last question for you then. For all of the young people finishing their degrees right now and coming into the industry, what's your biggest piece of advice for them? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's volume. Yeah, getting out and doing a lot of dentistry is, is really critical. Um, yeah, whilst you may want to be doing a certain type of dentistry that, yeah, you can maybe, you know, focus on that in, in your dentistry, but just get out there and do, you know, get a busy job. Um, that's really important. I, I would probably put busy above mentoring um, because mentoring can be so typically the, the really highly productive and, and good dentists um, don't actually have time um, to do, do mentoring. Um, so yeah, get out there and get a really busy job for at least at least two years and then start, you know, okay, understanding where you're at and then go out and seek someone you think, okay, like what they're doing, you know, do they have an associate role? Can I start doing part-time with them while I have my other role and then build into where you want to go? And yeah, there's lots of lots of avenues in dentistry. It's um, yeah, there's, it's a, there are, you know, the specialties are fantastic. Um, you know, public dentistry is fantastic, you know, aesthetic stuff's cool. Um, there's all sorts everywhere in between. Mm. Well, incredible advice. Dr. Tony, thank you so much for joining us on Dental IQ this week. We're really looking forward to having you back on soon to talk more about, you know, Lens Dental and also how the Aligner Therapy uh, project is going for you guys as well. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, take care until we see you next. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Tony. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Dental IQ. If you enjoyed the podcast, please follow us and leave a rating. And you can also find us on Instagram at dental underscore IQ. If you'd like to join us on Dental IQ or have any topics that you want us to cover, you can reach me at fabio at dentaliq.com.au. Thank you so much for joining us again. We hope to catch you next week. Dental IQ is produced by Highsmile.